This week we're six months old. Yay! So grab a drink, alcoholic or not, to celebrate this milestone and come with us as we talk whistleblowers, a proudly terrible theme park, a secret society of supervillains, and the fight to stop fighting and let diplomacy work. But first, we gotta go to the emergency room. I don't know. I don't know. How much longer? When can we see? When do we get results? Doctors? Medicine? I'm just a nurse. I'm an attendant. From 1 to 10 now. Where does it hurt? And you're next in line. Sign here. No, not at this time. How much fucking longer? I don't know. I don't know. Isn't this called the emergency room? Every time I see you walking slow, I want to scream just so that you know there's so much pain. Waiting for Godot, the angst and anxiety grow and my mind holds on that story of doctors who fled their home country only to come to this land of plenty and be told. There are simply so many bathrooms to clean, lawns to be mowed. I guess we're good on the health care and so here have some have a broom and some bleach, common sense just out of reach. Behind that thick curtain of capitalist trash, a stash of great minds waiting to find their worth in a system with none. It's bullshit, you know. The richest country that can't find a dime for one healthy life, but millions appear for guns, drones, and riot gear. Fuck, where is a nurse? An intern, I don't need a room, just strip me right here. That curtain won't cover the gashes and wounds, the sad, sickly waste of a corporatist state. How much longer, please, how much longer? I don't know, I don't know. Well, I know that a ma'am or that sweet southern smile won't make the wait seem worthwhile. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know it's not your fault. You wanted to help people, cure the sick, calm the suffering. It's not your fault. Yet, still, here we sit in this vault of calamity, shut off from humanity, sanity given in doses, white robes in pastel-colored corridors, locked doors and muffled screams, smiley face stickers, fluorescent lights making your head spin. Wait, I wasn't the patient. Check my pulse, is it racing? No? Fuck, this place makes you sick. So thick with the illness, a flickering light slashing the stillness. An overworked nurse pushes a bed like a hearse. Can it get any worse? Sleep deprived, so low that I'm high, this overly sanitized hell reeks of death. Cafeteria like a fat kid's delirium, happy place. Is there a space where I could actually dim the lights, quiet my mind, get a food item that never had a fucking face? A poster reads, excellence is our main goal. An old woman's cries now turn to groans. Is Bedlam closed? Now open, overflowing, we don't have a room yet. Yes, they're on their way. Do you have any patience to spare? Just shoot it up in that hole that you drilled when a few drops of blood spilled. No, 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 don't apologize. It's the most honest shade that I've seen since I've been here. Let me be clear. We don't know. We don't know. It could be, it should be. I, I just called it in. One minute, you're next. We have to wait for those tests. Yes, I'll hold. I'll accept these charges, what else can I do? I'll lay in this irony that finally here at a hospital where one goes to get well, it's a veritable hell, and I'm not even the patient. Not a doctor, but these ills are so blatant. Life is fatal. A broken system quickens the slow. Death of a nation, a people, a person, your parents, your friends, and you. There's your relation. To this show, this station, this issue, it's personal. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is act out. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point. Whistleblowers. The concept is pretty simple, see something, say something. This also happens to be a government slogan, but fuck me, if I had a nickel for every time the government did something hypocritical, uh, I think I'd probably be able to buy my own member of Congress at this point. But I digress. A whistleblower is essentially anyone who exposes evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality. Now a spy is not a whistleblower, and a whistleblower is not a spy. At absolute worst, and in the most juvenile sense of the word, whistleblowers are tattletales. But sometimes, you do have to tattle. For example, if your childhood friends were being waterboarded in the backyard, eh, that might be a situation where you should tattle. And this was exactly John Kiriakou's point. In 2012, John Kiriakou was charged under the Espionage Act for exposing the CIA's extensive use of torture. 
He was, at the time of the leaks in 2007, a CIA employee and the first government official to confirm the use of torture by CIA interrogators. Why? Well, in short, as he explains in the Guardian article, at the CIA, employees are trained to believe that nearly every moral issue is a shade of gray. But that's simply not true. Some issues are black and white, and torture is one of them. And not only is the use of torture something that gnawed at his moral compass, but the fact that all officials, from his boss to the president, were denying it. In the interest of protecting torturers and their crooked scheming, they covered it up. And Kiriakou thought, well, fuck that. Let's uncover it. The American people deserve to know what their country is doing in the people's name. And not surprisingly, Obama didn't like that. So, what did they do? They threw Kiriakou into jail where he served two years before the charges against him were dropped. However, he then had to remain under house arrest until May 1st of this year, and now he's on federal probation. It's a pretty lofty sentence for a guy who, even according to the courts, didn't actually commit a crime. Certainly didn't commit the crime of spying. However, in its long sleazy history, the Espionage Act hasn't really cared about that distinction. In fact, it was originally used against political enemies, from Victor Berger, a socialist, to Eugene Debs, also a socialist, who was in fact sentenced to 10 years in jail just for speaking out against the Espionage Act. Yay, freedom. And yet, the Espionage Act didn't really get to full steam until Obama settled into the White House. Yep, good old I heart transparency Obama has prosecuted seven people, I can't even do that on one hand, seven people under the Espionage Act. That's more than all other administrations combined. The aforementioned John Kiriakou is one of them, Thomas Drake, Shemai Leibowitz, Stephen Jinwoo Kim, Chelsea Manning, Jeffrey Sterling, and Edward Snowden are the others. And what do they all have in common? Well, besides being charged as enemies of the state, they've been extra-legally, or outside the legal system, extra-legally treated like enemies of the state, guilty until proven innocent. As Kiriakou writes in that same Guardian article, the purpose of the Espionage Act prosecution is not to punish a person for spying on the enemy, or for the enemy, excuse me, selling secrets for personal gain or trying to undermine our way of life. It is to ruin the whistleblower personally, professionally, and financially. It is meant to send a message to anybody else considering speaking truth to power. Challenge us, and we will destroy you. This experience echoes across the cases of the Obama Seven, as they are cutely called. Thomas Drake, for example, who used to be a senior executive at the NSA before blowing the whistle on his own employers, found himself without a job and in the midst of a full-on character assassination, losing his home, his family, and any credibility within his profession. Edward Snowden, I'm sure you've heard of him, another fine example, smeared as arrogant, egomaniacal, an anti-American college dropout traitor. Chelsea Manning, traitor, clearly mentally ill, thrown into a barbaric marine prison for over a year, then denied the chance to even appear in court to defend herself until almost two years after the arrest. She is now serving a 35-year sentence. Yeah, the goal is pretty clear. Break the whistleblower so as to dissuade others from standing up to the system. And last week, the fascist hammer fell on Chelsea again when she was threatened with indefinite solitary confinement because of... toothpaste. I'm serious. Toothpaste. Toothpaste and reading materials. Expired toothpaste found in her cell brought a charge of medicine misuse. A copy of Malala, The Many Faces of Anonymous, a novel on transgender issues, and a Cosmo magazine, which may be a shitty magazine, but certainly doesn't warrant solitary confinement, that brought a charge of prohibited property. On top of that, she was also charged with one count of putting food onto the floor and one count of being quote-unquote contemptuous to a guard. Now, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to feel that this case eh, isn't quite right. I wonder if it has anything to do with her burgeoning Twitter account with 50,000 plus followers or the fact that thousands of people across the world support her unconditional release. And in fact, last week, activists delivered more than 100,000 signatures to the U.S. Army at the Pentagon calling for the new charges to be dropped. And they sort of were. Although Chelsea was found guilty of possessing prohibited materials, she will not be facing solitary confinement. According to her official Twitter account, she will instead receive a 21-day suspension of recreation. No gym, library, or outdoors. And while that's certainly fucking outrageous, as her ACLU attorney put it, there's no doubt that this support kept Chelsea out of solitary confinement. So, let's show, let's show some support. Everybody loves a whistleblower. Hmm? 
So to further support Chelsea and the other whistleblowers fighting for truth and justice, check out the next slide with information on how to follow and learn more about some of the Obama 7 and to support their work. <laughs> Let's talk theme parks. And unlike the consumerist utopias slathered in lard and sugar, this theme park is proudly dystopian. It's a pointedly honest blend of fantasy and the all too real, an escape from mindless escapism brought to you by Banksy. Yep, in his largest project yet, Banksy has rolled out the Dismaland of Amusement Park, a quote unquote festival of art, amusements, and an entry level ar anarchism. Situated on two and a half acres of seafront site in Western Supermare on the west coast of England, this amusement park proudly calls itself the UK's most disappointing new visitor attraction and features cardboard metal detectors, a model village complete with 3,000 riot police staged in the aftermath of large-scale civil unrest, a how-to on unlocking bus stop posters and installing them with a more informative line of advertising, a pocket loan shop that offers money to kids at a $5,000 $5, interest rate, a model boat pond with dead bodies and overcrowded boats full of asylum seekers, a merry-go-round where a butcher has commandeered one of the horses to make lasagna with, and 10 new original Banksy pieces, including a Cinderella crash, crash by the large, seemingly burnt-out castle, and a giant pinwheel tangled in plastic, and some more that I can't even think of or have pictures of. The park is open for only five weeks until September 27th. Tickets are three pounds and are available on the Disneyland website where they caution would-be patrons that the following ar articles are strictly prohibited. Spray paint, marker pens, knives, and legal representatives of the Walt Disney Corporation. So there you have it, a five week window to visit the theme park whose theme is, according to Banksy, the theme park should have bigger themes. Now, speaking of Britain and entry-level anarchism, I'd like to introduce you to the Secret Society of Supervillain Artists, a group of artists specializing in beer drinking, art making, wheat pasting, scheming, sticker slapping, stencil cutting, pencil drawing, wall painting, motivating, aerosol shaking, photoshopping, paint mixing, campaigning, entertaining, and always dreaming. This group, bound by their individuality and lack of binding ties, aims to make a difference in the world and have some fun while doing it. To uncover some of the mystery behind their secret society, I spoke with the covered up founder of SSOSVA, Silent Bill. Take a look. Um, so I will just go ahead and jump right in here. Um, the Secret Society of Supervillain Artists. What can you tell me about it uh, and why did you start it? Um, it started it basically because. Um... You know, when I was younger and stuff, never fitted in anywhere. You know, I was into heavy metal. Mosh just didn't let me hang around them because I didn't look like, you know, someone into metal. Um, grew up on a council estate with, you know, loads of scally kids and all that, but they didn't seem to like me because I didn't rob cars, you know. So the posh kids didn't like me because I was a scally from a council estate. So it was just... Basically, that carried on through life. Started to see the same thing in art. Do you know what I mean? Making art. All, all the arty farties, you know, they they didn't give a shit. They, they're not interested. All my stuff was too lowbrow humor. So, just started doing my own thing just to make myself laugh and putting stuff up. So, just did it from there. Just did it for a laugh. Realized people started to join. More people, you know what I mean? Basically, didn't fit into any you know, genre or pigeonhole or whatever. And then that just started from there, really. It was just, just, a, just a bit of a laugh. How did the, uh, the Secret Society of Supervillain Artists become this, this place where art, urban artists and, you know, political artists flock to? It's the actual members themselves that make it what it is. They all do their own thing. 
they all organise, you know, exhibits. We have exhibits around the world and stuff. Um, you know, first one was in Spain. Um, dickhead me missed me flight. I turned up the day after. So, you know, that adds to the myth of it all. And it's just like, you know, it is It is basically just organised anarchy. So at these exhibits, do you do you introduce yourself, like, without a mask and everything? Is it is it sort of that... Or do you maintain the mystery? No, 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 no. Everyone knows who I am, basically. But we all respect each other's... Um, do you know what I mean? A lot of them don't want to be seen. Right. Mine's not because I think it's, like, an urban street cool thing. I work in a sector looking after, you know, ex-offenders and stuff. Mm -hmm. And ex-criminals, I'm rehabilitating them. And it's like, I can't be seen to be going out spraying walls and then, you know what I mean? <laughs> so... That's why I, you know, that's my personal choice. I think a lot of people have this this duality. You said that you were, you have a job that it wouldn't look good if people found out that this is something that you do. I think a lot of people work in that sort of medium. Is 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 art not just a creative outlet for you, but also a way to, to put your opinion out there? You know, on the site it says uh, making a difference and having fun doing it, um, shifting paradigms. Is this your way to be politically engaged? Yeah, you totally hit the nail on the head there. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's the only voice a lot of us have got. I started doing it as like the only way I could have my little rant. Do you know what I mean? That was, and then it's, it, a lot of people feel the same way and stuff. And, you know, and then they all come together. But like you say, they're all of some kind of care and nature. You know, none of them are actual criminals, vandals or anything of that sense. Um, and they all want to do some good. Be it, be it like, you know, trying to change the world or raising money for good causes and stuff. So, yeah, there's definitely, like you say, a, a dual ally. I can't even pronounce it. I'm not even drunk as well, so. <laughs> Maybe um, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so is part of this also trying to change the art world? Because the art world has gotten, you know, just like the music industry, which is my industry originally, it's just puffed up and it's vapid and it's apathetic. Is that also part of what you're doing, trying to put a little edge back into the art world and trying to make the art world change to pay attention to these issues as well? Yeah, it's like, it's totally, it's all dominated by people with money, you know what I mean, and things like that. and. You know, a lot of us have got no chance of, you know, exhibiting in certain places or, you know, doing certain things. So, yeah, it's kind of just a way of, you know, just like telling them, you know, go ahead, fuck yourselves. You know, the, it, the actual application as well, we get in trouble all the time because it says on it, return to the Tate, you know, in London. Right. And you get, they got really, really annoyed because people were actually posting them to the Tate and then, he told us on Twitter, and now I'm like, yeah, laughing my head off, saying, don't send us any more. I'm like, yeah, come on, keep sending them. <laughs> so, a couple of weeks ago, they sent me an email saying, listen, we've asked you now to stop. Um, we've got uh, quite a lot of your applications here. Where would you like them send? And I said, oh, that's brilliant. That, uh, yeah, uh, send them to the tape, please. You know what I mean? Just to wind them up some more. So, <laughs> it's just trying to bait them, really, as if they just say, you know, like they'd ever let, you know, any. Right. Anybody exhibit there that way of, you know, some kind of high art standing. And if you go in there, it's full of shit. I, you know I, what I mean? I, it's, it's full of absolute shit. It's like the music industry now. It's just dominated by manufactured shite. So. What are a couple of the 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 tenets or the goals of the the secret society? Um, the actual goals. I don't really know. We it's. That's a difficult one now. We just wanna, you know, do do some good things we can. Um, get bigger. Anyone can just come along, join. Um, I prefer people that you know want to join and and do their own thing as well. You know, you know, whatever you want to do. If if they're into knitting, maybe you know, that's like you know. As long as long as you want to do good via knitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, gorilla grannies and all that who do some knitting. Um, you could knit as balaclavas and stuff. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I'm not very good at selling it. I kind of, 
I just leave it to sell itself and people to stumble upon it and stuff. That's the way I like it because people are always asking where's the uh, application form and how do I join and I kind of think if you can't work it out, Jesus, what chance have you got of <laughs> actually doing anything, you know? Seriously, good point, that. And now I'm speaking British. <laughs> to learn more about the Secret Society and to start your own application, go to ssosva.com.uk. Now, rounding out this week's episode, let's take a quick look at the front lines of diplomacy. If you'll recall from previous episodes, diplomacy is struggling to find a foothold in this most hawkish home of bloodthirsty shitbags, Washington, D.C. This deal with Iran could and should write our way out of yet another bloody conflict in the Middle East, trading guns for inspectors, bombs for talks. And what's really great about this deal is it employs straight-up common sense. Iran doesn't love the crushing sanctions we placed on them. We don't either. And we sure as shit don't need any more enemies in the world, particularly in that area. Allowing inspectors to monitor Iran's nuclear facilities just makes sense. Remember, it's what we didn't do in Iraq, only to find out later that uh, <laughs> we should have fucking done it. But as is the case with almost everything in this country, common sense is just as frowned upon as diplomacy. And several people with several billion dollars and nothing to fucking do <clears throat> are attempting to buy another war, crushing diplomacy before it even gets started. About a week and a half ago, activists around the world staged Peace with Iran events, showing their support of diplomacy over war. From Boston to Paris, to Tajikistan, to Toronto, thousands of people stood in solidarity with one another, with the Iranian people and the American people to tell both governments, and indeed pretty much the whole fucking world, don't be hawkish, closed-minded asshats and give peace a fucking chance. Although their verbiage might have been slightly varied, and if you missed this awesomeness, have no fear. On August 30th, a.k.a. this Sunday, NIAC, the National Iranian American Council, the pro-peace, oh, hello, the pro-peace Iranian American lobby, will be hosting a peace picnic in D.C. Not in D.C.? Well, my revolutionary lovelies, make your own peace picnic. The only real criteria is that you support peace and, like, picnics, because who doesn't? Also, happening today, Democracy for America is organizing actions across the country in support of the Iran deal. Check out democracyforamerica.com for more info and events around you. Also, mark your calendars for September 8th, when Code Pink will be hosting a Hands Across the Capitol in support of the Iran deal event in D.C. September 8th is namely the day that Congress gets back from recess, and with hundreds of anti-Iran deal lobbyists ready to flood Congress and trade dollars for death, Code Pink and, well, our planet, could use the support. If you can't make it on the 8th and you have something against picnics, take a look at these sample tweets and images to post in support of diplomacy. gents, that about does it for this week's show. Thank you so much for watching and celebrating our six-month anniversary. And a special shout-out to Brendan Morgan. Keep watching, keep fighting. The future is ours if we want it. Please spread and share this show and all the other episodes with all your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, check out the last slide to see all the sites that I mentioned in this week's show. There will also be a link to help support Occupy.com and all of the delicious descent delivered daily thanks to donations like yours. It is a 501c3, so anything that you can contribute is tax deductible, tax deductible as well, and hugely appreciated. I haven't started drinking, I swear. <clears throat> be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. 
from the loud and leaf-falling devil's den, good night and act out.